Hello, everyone, and welcome to KSO Front Row, the Kamloops Symphony's newly minted web series that brings you an up close and gives you an intimate look at what we do here at the Kamloops Symphony, right from very own home. As you may have heard in that splashy introduction, my name is Daniel Mills, and I'm the executive director of the Kamloops Symphony. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm presently speaking from Tecumseh to Shipwepmik within the unceded traditional lands of Shipwepmik Nation. And I'd also like to acknowledge all the native lands on which we are gathered across the globe. We are very grateful to be spread out over such a beautiful planet that we call home. So as many of you are aware, we have recently made the difficult decision to cancel our final two concerts of the 2019-20 season for safety reasons for the performers and community. And although we are very sad to not be on stage performing you now, I can assure you we have absolutely no intention in putting our programming on complete hold. And as such, we're hard at work developing new and engaging musical experiences for you and can't wait to invite you along for the adventures to come. Of course, more, te more details will be announced later in the summer about this. In the meantime, however, this web series, which we have now branded KSO Front Row, was created as a way to further engage with all of you, our loyal subscribers and ticket holders, our artists, our choristers, our sponsors, volunteers, why we are programming within our current circumstances. So before I introduce the two stars of today's session, I do want to offer a few thank yous. Of course, we want to thank our public funders who have stepped up in a major way to ensure the Canada Symphony and arts organizations across the country can continue operating, specifically the BC government through the BC Arts Council and the government of Canada through the Canada Council for the Arts. As well, thank you to all our sponsors who have continued their support of us during this time, our donors, and of course, all the ticket holders who have chosen to donate your tickets to our canceled performances back to us. All of you will ensure that we're here for the long term, continuing to deliver the musical experiences you have come to love. So thank you very much. So about today's session, I'm sure you're aware by now, it does not feature me, but music director Dina Gilbert and our wonderful chorus master Thomas Bjork. With, uh, with both of their energy levels, you are surely in for an engaging and fun time, believe you, me. <laughs> Dina and Tomas will begin with a bit of a dialogue about themselves and what it takes to direct and lead a choir. Then Tomas will launch into a brief vocal workshop for, so all of you at home can work on your vocal technique and then they'll resume and come back together to chat a little bit more. Today's session is, uh, session is meant to be interactive. So although we took questions in advance, which we've tried to incorporate. By all means, we welcome you to submit your own questions in the live chat, and we'll try to get to them as we go. We will also have a dedicated question and answer session at the end to answer all your burning questions. So if you wanna wait until then, that also works for us. So thanks again to my colleague, Ryan, who is on the back end editing as we go and uh, helping put this all together. Again, although we've tried to work out as many of the kinks as we can, with these online streaming platforms. We do ask for your patience in case any technical difficulties arise, but hopefully none will, so. Well, that's enough from me. Uh, let's get to business, shall we? So I'd like to welcome to our screen two of our very special guests today, our very own music director, Dina Gilbert, and our KSO chorus master, Tomas Bjork. And there they are. Yay. Hello, how are you both? Excited. Great. Good, good, yeah. So yeah. Dina, you're you're in Montreal, correct? Yeah. Still, yeah, still there, yeah. <laughs> and Tomas, you're here in Kamloops? Yes. Yes. Have you both been keeping throughout all this? Well, since last I week's spoke, I should say. <laughs> exactly. I mean, just knowing that we can hear, for example, Tomas playing a little bit of piano tonight and, and being able to have a voice lesson for me is kind of like something really appreciated that in these uh, difficult times. So every kind of, of, of ways we can connect with each other, I find really interesting. Yeah, for, for me, it's been, a, it's been a stretch. Of course, we haven't been able to do our work the way we normally do in person, engaging with people. So it's been a challenge to learn new ways to engage. So today will be another experiment to see if uh, through technology and this virtual approach, we can do some singing at the piano. So I'm looking forward to that. Perfect. Well, uh, well, thank you so much both for joining us. And I'm sure our audience members are going to enjoy this session, regardless of how it turns out. So thanks so much. Without further ado, I'll leave it to both of you and I'll skedaddle out of the screen until the end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> see you later. Ah, uh, Tomas, I'm so excited to be discussing with you about uh, choral singing and obviously music. Um, yes. As music director, you know, uh, when I first started, first arrived in Kamloops, what was impressing me was the level of 
dedication people were putting into choral singing. For me, as a Quebecoise, I felt, wow, yeah. something special here to be nurtured uh, and to there's a possibility, a lot of potential also for uh, programming uh, big choir works. But therefore, yeah. if I'm going into this, I needed someone who were to be really helping me in this process. <laughs> therefore, I've bec I, I came into the mission of finding the right person, you know? And uh, right. this is how I met. Do you remember that first meeting we had uh, with a coffee at Motivo? Right. That was that was in Cafe Motivo down on Victoria Street. And I remember we had chatted on the phone previously. And that was the first time we met. And I was sitting in the back there waiting. And I remember, I think you spilled your coffee about three times coming to the table. And then you said, but I, I am this way. Anyway, so. I spilled my coffee just before that, so I had a big rag there beside me. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, that was fun. I remember that. And I remember we chatted, we exchanged some histories and uh, some uh, passions about what we do. And then you came up this, uh, at the end of the meeting, you came up with this wonderful, crazy idea that you want to do Carmina Burana in Kamloops. And, uh, and inside, I was a little bit like, ah! Oh! But, I, but outside, I said, sure, I'll do it. You know? And actually, I remember that time because like I thought, okay, you might just find I'm the most crazy person thinking about implementing as a first year project for choir. Oh, let's just get like 100 people to sing Camina Brana. Yeah. yeah, that's that's going to work yeah. out, right? So uh, it was exciting for me to see how dynamic, enthusiastic you were. Uh, and also the kind of, I would say from the discussion I had with you, we were really on the same page regarding the quality of what we wanted to achieve. But also right. the yeah. vision of like, we will be growing into this project. And of course, this is something really, really important for the community. Um, yeah. Also having the sense with your personality, so dynamic and such, I thought, you know, then chorister will have fun, but at the same time, they will work hard. And for me, this right. was the yeah. perfect, perfect blend of qualities and skills I could have wished for a chorus master. So this, therefore, well, thank you. this is why I thought, okay, this is the person uh, I need that will make it happen. So I was excited about that. Right. Well, I was very excited about uh, doing Carmina Burana because, of course, it's a it's a major uh, work uh, and it's a major part of the repertoire. Uh, also, uh, the approach that we took, I remember the very, very first meeting we had with all the chor choral directors in town, just getting the word out. And in the end, we ended up with a lovely collaboration. I remember uh, because we are a community ensemble, and I think that's really important to remember. And we ended up with a wonderful collaboration where we were also engaging students from the high schools to come out. And we had them training with the TRU Chamber Course, which is uh, which I'm music director of as well, and training them and then creating this mentorship, a mentoring system with the chorus. So we have these young kids coming up and we have this diversity of ages. And, you know, you have the more experienced singers uh, reaching out and teaching the younger ones. And it was interesting because by the time we had the end of this experience, we were all on stage. I have to say it was a professional uh, outcome. It was a professional result with our community, with hard work. But at the same time, we really did engage all sort of strata of the community. We really had, we had young kids there that some were like 14 years old mm -hmm. and, you know, with, with everybody up, you know, in, in our, you know, our more uh, respected elder, you know, in our community. Yeah, community. And actually, I, I, when I'm thinking about this performance of Carmina Burana, I'm thinking about how much challenging it was, of course, from the piece itself, yeah. because it's a massive orchestration where winds are by th three uh, per section and such, uh, two pianos, yeah. A uh, full five percussionists or, five or six percussionists would be required usually and such. But then that sagebrush roof um, oh, yes. happened. And then yeah, we yeah, that's right. all these people somewhere else. <laughs> so this was, I recall um, some really interesting uh, conversation with Kathy, who was, uh, was executive director, about how we're going to manage this. And then we, get, we got to. Right to be at Oasis Church, but then we needed right. an extra stage to fit everyone. And uh, I oh, recall things like all next to each other, really politely trying to be there. So because we <laughs> oh yes, I remember that. Yeah, we well, want I, them to be sitting in the stage. Yeah, I had I had uh, 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 how would you say reports from the chorus, uh, and uh, you know the tenors were up in the rafters, sort of half on stage, half clinging to the wall. 
and the heat was incredible. We had to turn off the fans because they were squeaking, they were whistling. So during the show, we had to turn off the AC and the, the singers were uh, like sardines, but you know, with our theater shut down, but it was a little bit of a hidden blessing because our darling, lovely theater in town is like singing in a coffin and singing in that church that we had to use, actually, uh, the acoustics were amazing. You know? Yeah, you're right. You're right that this was better. Though I just I remember that until the the day that we could actually fit there I was just. But what is happening? If we cannot just fit on stage. What are we gonna do? And actually, well, we were creative. Speaking, sorry, <laughs> huh? we were creative. I remember discussion about so who can stand between the timpani and who can go stand by the cellos. And I remember, I remember poor Jeremy, uh, one uh, one of our horn players there, Jeremy Bose. I remember. Uh, trying having to coach the chorus on now when you're walking through the horn section <laughs> to get on stage you know so i mean but i we had we had a wonderful group we were really uh, flexible and yeah. really able to adapt yeah and, and talking about adapting to a piece of music like that i mean harmonically when you listen to it it sounds rather simplistic but that's deceiving when you work the chorus parts it is incredibly difficult the articulations the the way that it lines up with the orchestral part and the type of articulation and the type of sound production that's required in some of those sections is really quite almost virtuosic. And, you know, working with that ensemble, I love working with community ensembles. Uh, and I have to say it's different than working with the professional ensemble because the professional ensemble, you say, I want pianissimo there. I want a little more staccato. I want a little bit more crescendo, slowly write this in, blah, blah, blah. And then you just get everybody to do it. What I find myself doing, I would say 90% of the time, is teaching methodology while I am asking for the musical uh, result that I want. So when you're working with chorus in that respect, you are teaching the technical. You go back to the, I go back to the physicality. I want these notes here. If I want somebody to sing it, I have to talk about what the body has to do, how to stand in there, how to then imagine it. What am I doing? It's always method, always yeah. method with, oh. with community choir. And but you know what? Even when I was singing in professional ensembles and on stage, I always found that the, my favorite conductors were conductors that all used method, whether you were being paid or not. It doesn't matter. You know, and I tried to use that with the community ensembles. So rehearsal then becomes a giant voice lesson. And I found out that if I use method and my musical idea immediately, rather than waiting after we learn the notes and everything, and then we talk about something musical. I mean, why do we use technique? Why do you use method? Is to achieve a music musical result, a musical idea, right? So I find myself doing that a lot when I work with choirs and what's really exciting what was so exciting working with the KSO chorus and not just Carmina Burana also the video game music which was ironic because it was like I, I don't want to sing video game music you know but once we sang it and it sounded really good everybody was like we're singing video game music you know they're really yeah. proud of it and it was so <laughs> that, that concert and what I like from this was to actually so people can understand that sometimes we are um We think music is not accessible. It's not for us. So it was funny mm. that people who are, huh, video game, uh, that's my thing. But actually, they were reading through the orchestral result of some really so good soundtracks. Yeah. Um, and also the people who are playing video games were like, oh my God, this is exciting. And we, this is one of yeah. the opportunity we actually joined with like you say some higher uh, uh, chorister from uh, high school who were really talented uh, and who right. joined us for this project thinking of, about video yeah. games how they might be interested about this and the result result was super Absolutely. Cool. and there's someone else Absolutely. that I would like to thank so much uh, Rachel Casponi because thanks yes. We had also the incredible young voices from the Candles Thompson Honor Choir when we did Carmina yeah. because there's yeah. also a children's choir. There's like two different choirs plus an addition of children's choirs. And again, you haven't seen them in the setup because there was no way they could be feeling there. But it was actually super beautiful in the Oasis Church because they were in the aisle alley uh, and also right. in the, uh, of the stairs going up. 
Um, and it was so, so beautiful to have their voice also uh, reunited. Right. So this project was super great to showcase the talent we had and also Absolutely. the are building projects all together uh, in, in two, actually a sold out concert and performance. So I was just sad actually we, we just did it once, you know, for all that work. Yeah. Uh, and you know what? It was, it was amazing to see, you know, in Camus, we are so fortunate. We really are a singing town. We really are seeing town, the amount of choirs per capita, I wonder if anybody's actually done the math, but we have so many choirs and good choirs and uh, the kind of work that's being done by super, very committed uh, individuals such as Rachel, I mean, with, with the children, I remember them lined up, like you were saying on the stairs and they and nobody saw them. And when they started singing, the whole audience turned around <laughs> and uh, like these little angel voices, it was, it was brilliant to have that collaboration. And they were so well-behaved. I wonder if they were that well-behaved at home. I highly doubt it. <laughs> I have Shana saying in the comment, it was so hot in there. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everybody needed to kind of like uh, be a little bit more flexible regarding these crazy circumstances. But at the end of yeah. the day, I recall so many great comments from this experience of actually being able to perform Camina Burana for the first time in, with our symphony orchestra in town. So wonderful. the last time though, next time it will be in a really nice venue, right? That's right. Not in, you know, I, I, uh, I hate to say it, but you know what? Uh, I've sung solo in, in the, uh, in uh, solo work in the Sagebrush theater. And it is like singing in a coffin. The sound mm -hmm. goes out and it dies. And you know, Sometimes I wonder, we have such hard work coming out of our musicians in Kamloops. Even the orchestra, we have such fantastic uh, musicians. And also we have fantastic singing happening with our chorus. The innuendo and all the beautiful detail is lost. Because pe what people don't understand is that the venue is an extension. It's part of the musical instrument. Totally. Is yes. The hall is the part of the musical instrument. And, and you know, can keep praying <laughs> that you know I, I it's so it's so terrifying you know the setbacks you know with this pandemic we've been experiencing and the response has been amazing but at the same time you know i hope we can really jump on the bandwagon with that once this is, once we come back to some sort of normal because we need to showcase the amazing talent we have and of course working so intimately with the singers uh, we need to be able to hear that i want a choir loft behind the you know stage so we can actually hear what we're doing and it, you know i'm thinking back working with the choir it, some of the sounds that i hear in rehearsal uh, are are amazing you know and i i believe what happens in rehearsal is just as important as what happens on the performance oh yes i totally agree yes. about it. Yeah, it's a never ending process, even though yeah. it's like if we take a picture of where we are at, but it's never ending for how we are going to get peace and a work. And now yeah. we'll discuss a little bit with you because people discovered if people were there last three, we uh, three weeks ago about what I'm usually doing as an orchestral conductor is, and most of my work is not actually just waving my arms at the concert and taking a bow at the end. People who were there understood that there's a lot of score study and such. But what then? Yeah. Can you explain what is my role regarding a choral work and what is yours? <laughs> How do we share that kind of uh, work? And of course, you're stretching your work on a much more extended period of time because uh, right. express yeah. how do your rehearsal are, are going? How it's how it's done? Well, as far as as far as you know, being a chorus master, you do you have preparation and. I always sweat when I'm preparing. <laughs> I'm always scared and nervous because I'm working on my music and I'm studying the music. And I'm listening to it. I'm playing things on the piano and I'm listening and I'm, and I'm trying to imagine in my head as a singer, because that's what I did. I am a singer trying to imagine where the breathing will happen, you know, in the context of maintaining a musical line so that the music makes sense, but at the same time it's accessible to the singers. You know, so this is this is the kind of stuff I'm hashing out in my brain while I'm trying to do with my score study. Then I arrive in rehearsal and I throw half of that away <laughs> and once I have but the people there, right? But uh, and coming back to in the rehearsal, um, I like to, I don't do let's warm up at home and come ready. I, I don't believe in that because I like to teach. I think the warm up is not a, uh, for the sake of just physically warming things up. 
It's an opportunity to teach things, to create a common language. Um, singing is a little bit different because I can't pull it out and say, here, look, right here. It's not like, here, press this, and it comes yeah. out. That's you know? more, more abstract, huh? So it's really hard for to make yeah. The work is up here. The work is up here. So we have to come to a common language using symbolic language about different things we want. So a large chunk of my rehearsing is teaching vocal technique in the warm-up coming to a common language so that when I then when I'm in rehearsal, I can use that methodology and say, okay, in this passage, remember what we did there. Uh, and I'll use the same language to draw out what I need in that passage. So it, I don't know if some people might think that it's, it's uh, using more time, but in my experience is I can get what I want very quickly. Uh, by giving people the tools they need to do what they what I want them to do musically, and and it's very interesting because it, even in some passages, you know, my my experience with working with choirs is people forget to breathe all the time. People are forgetting to breathe, and and you might think it's uh you know mon how would you say uh, you like it's something you wouldn't have to say, but uh, you have to remind people to breathe all the time. And in different ways. And uh, it's my experience. If you can bring the technique back in the rehearsing process, then people begin to get it. And it happens very quickly. And working with community ensembles, it's not good enough to say, go home and learn it. That never works. That doesn't work. You get people scared. They go home. They pretend to learn it. They come back. They're like this. And they don't know how to do what you want to do. So I, as a chorus master, I've always stuck by teach while you rehearse especially with community ensembles. If something isn't working, you have to create a different way to explain it. The average person needs the same thing explained three different times in three different ways before they get it. That's how we learn. So you can imagine you have a group of 50 people. You have to come up with some colorful language, you know, to explain stuff. But pictures pictures are worth a thousand words. So uh, the, the choir is probably laughing at some of our visualizations that we have during some, I mean, Carmina Burana was full of visualizations, you know. Yeah, but, totally, uh, totally. And actually, I mean, this is the, the way, I mean, we can work together. For example, I have my vision of the full orchestra. And obviously when I'm, Usually when I'm working with choirs, I'm, I'm working mostly with professional choirs. So they are all people who have the background you have. So therefore I'm asking something musical, they will find out right away the kind of technical aspect that will make it with the right solution right away. Right. Therefore, this is why I needed you there because I felt, okay, is my, my, uh, my almost, uh, my voice concert master, if I would say, because mm -hmm. if I'm asking something, I know that like, I'd rather ask Tomas, what would be your trick here? I would like this line, mm -hmm. and then you will understand how to communicate it to every single person in the yeah. choir. Make sure we aim exactly what music, right. what musically uh, uh, demand, uh, demanded there. So this is how we can, uh, work. And of course, I'm coming at a rehearsal, and then I might say, "Okay, Tomas, am I already burning out your choir? Isn't that right?" So, <laughs> so we are we are kind of like working like this, uh, so people get also used to my gesture and such. So. I come in at times at the rehearsal, but most of the work uh, and the routine, they get really used to the way you're working uh, with uh, working with you, of course, and uh, project by project, then they get a little bit uh, better from the experience of being on stage and performing and such. I'm seeing some wonderful people who've been joining us and would like to just say big highs. I, uh, I, I'm seeing Evan saying, hello, Dean and Thomas. Uh, Giovanni also in the choir saying thanks for doing this Dean and Thomas and of course wonderful Christy who's been also so helpful in so many di different projects so let's see yeah good to see you there I also saw at the beginning Matcha was there and actually could you discuss a bit about Matcha yes okay so, in the, to the choir the, yeah so Matcha is this wonderful woman <laughs> that we love and uh and beyond beyond help, uh, you know, Matcha, uh, beyond beyond the wonderful work that she does with the choir, she also drives the orchestra around with her wonderful giant bus through their tasteful excursions. And I'm sure you've taken a ride there with her a few times. And uh, when we started this uh, this year, uh, because we were really forming and regrouping how we run the choir, and and I've always said, you know, what I it's so much energy out to create the music, I just said, guys, I can't do the administrative side of it. And and a few people came out and 
and uh, Lynn Eberts was there as well. Also a wonderful lady who helped us with recordings and stuff, great stuff. And then we had a little group of people that we did, uh, how would you say, like section leads, so that we have a system of communicating. Uh, of course, if there's somebody in a section that has a concern about a part or they need to learn it, so we have a, a system by which we can address everybody's needs because sometimes people need extra help learning stuff. And Matcha created a list of who we have in the fire. And organize everything for me so it became this wonderful system i could actually talk to people when i needed to so it, it became this wonderful we've got organized okay we got organized and i don't know if you know choir people we're not the best at being organized so <laughs> but we get hurt feelings really easily you know choir people so <laughs> and of course, but it was great and of course so since you don't have the the orchestra at all your rear soul obviously that doesn't happen then who is your orchestra at rear souls then who oh right and then we have the wonderful daniela ofi who is our orchestra at the piano Mm -hmm. And she is just absolutely wonderful. And I've worked with Daniela for many, many years in Kamloops. And we've actually done a few concerts and recitals together when I did some singing here. And we produced a few shows together. And so I'm very happy now with this last season, we had Daniela working with us, which was great because we did uh, opera excerpts uh, at some point. And um, they were in Italian. And I mean, I've sung in Italian my entire career. But it's amazing when you do things, you know, automatically. And when you have to start uh, teaching it, it's almost like I started second guessing myself. Totally. So, so it was it was it was a real gift to have Daniela right there, who you know, once in a while, you know, a pencil would go flying across my head, and she said, "No, you say it like this." You know, no, she would never. No, she never threw pencils. I mean, <laughs> she was very gentle. She's but, uh, it was a real gift having her there, and she's an excellent musician as well. Yes, yes. Uh, actually, so, uh, when you just a technical thing, your microphone is a little bit quiet. I don't know if, uh, if Ryan can do anything about that. Yeah, we've been receiving a few comments that it's uh, chopping a little bit in the sound, unfortunately. So I'm wondering if you just take uh, take it slowly, if it's going to work better. I'm not sure. Uh, though, before we go into your mini voice lesson, Tomas, because time is flying really quickly, um, we received yep. two questions from uh, Sheila. We've been sending questions who's herself um, leading a choir, and she had two questions for you. The first one, how do I encourage memorization? I look up and most faces are buried in their books. I've even made acrobatic moves and, I mo and most people still don't get it. So what would be your advice for Sheila regarding memorization? So yeah, that's interesting because, um... This is kind of a trend, people memorizing music. And I think and I think that's great uh, if people want to do that. Um, unless you're in opera and you're acting on stage in the professional world, you don't memorize your music. Uh, all professional choirs use their music. And what I teach is how to use your music correctly in rehearsal. Uh, once you learn something like Carmina Burana or you've learned you know a bunch of opera courses like we were doing uh in concert you for concert performance you know the music I think it's more important to learn how to correctly read music and if you learn how to do that you get very good at having your music exactly where you need it so that you can see the music and see the conductor at the same time and you're using this really as a reference and what else does it do it carries your sound out. This is and, another very physical even thing more, that's very handy. Even more if you're in Sagebrush Theater, you need the, the projection help at all times. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I don't, uh, any professional choir that I ever sing with, unless we were singing opera, we never memorized anything. And uh, professional choirs don't memorize. I remember my first gig with the Prague Chamber Chorus. We were doing Beethoven's Mass in C major. And uh, we did it for, the, and it was funny because a friend of mine at school said, oh, you're going to come sing with us, right? And I said, oh, sure, when is the rehearsal? I had no idea who it was. And then I showed up at the rehearsal and I found out it was the Prague Chamber Chorus and they handed out the music and we all ciphered through the mass, Beethoven's mass, once. And I, okay, that's it. Then we had a second rehearsal with the orchestra and then we, we sang at the Prague Spring. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> You know, and everybody just read it, you know. 
And, and that's the way it, it really works, you know. So people get very good at reading and people get very good at reading and following the conductor at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you learn how to do that, I think you actually have more flexibility and more ability to do things than if you memorize your music and everybody's singing, memorize music, memorize music, fine. But uh, you you have to develop that skill as a chor choral singer. And, and my poor little happy choristers, I love them dearly. I, I've been whipping them for about a couple of years and, you know, they've really been learning how to do that. And we have eyes up here and, and they're sounding great, you know. Uh, I remember we used to go and record film music. Uh, we used to get these gigs as students, you know, so this big company would come into the Czech Republic and we'd all show up and be a hundred people, an orchestra, and then you see the movie going and you have beep, 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 and the conductor's just conducting and they hand out the, you know the oohs and ahs in the mu movie music? That's real people singing for very little money. <laughs> yes. But actually, at first, at least you don't have too much to, words to memorize and inflection and, 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 and pronunciation problems. And there, I mean, you still you need to blend the ah and stuff, but it's a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And scary ooh is really like, ooh, you know, you know, movie music is fun. <laughs> okay, another quick question uh, and answer before we get into your voice lesson again by Sheila. She really wants your guidance. Sure. Now she's asking, our singers are aged between or around 50s and to the 70s. How do we keep our voices flexible to reach higher notes? What exercises would be ideal? The first thing is to limit the amount of cigars that you consume over the weekend. <laughs> and uh, no, <laughs> uh, vocal hygiene, right? Uh, sing a little. Don't sing too much. People get this idea that if I sing for two hours a day, I'll become a better singer. It's not true. Uh, you can't practice the voice the way you would an instrument because it's flesh and cartilage. And these two little overglorified pieces of gristle in our throat are, are sens sensitive. They can handle a lot, okay? I think, you know, people are, you know, a little bit too afraid sometimes. But uh, it's very important to practice the vocal hygiene. Singing correctly practicing technique in short spurts of time and focusing that because if you sing with bad technique for two hours they'll drive you on a stretcher to the laryngologist you know but if you if you sing correct you learn the technique it's very important we're going to talk a little bit about some things today uh i i'll never forget the week before i flew back to uh, kamloops i went to a concert at the rudolfinum in prague And Edita Gruberova, who is a world-famous uh, coloratura soprano, had a concert, uh, just her and the orchestra in the Rurofino Beautiful Concert Hall. If you ever go to Prague, go find a concert there. It's great. Um, and it was fireworks on stage. The voice was agile. It was flying. It was fireworks. She was 74, 74 years old. Wow. And, and at that moment, I had this click, you know, Uh, longevity, singing, singing throughout your entire life, singing healthfully in a good way with good vocal hygiene th throughout your life, you know, you can sing forever, you know. The voice does change, but then if we have technique, we adapt to that change in the voice. But I think um, making sure you don't sing too much, don't wear it out. Sing it, use it intelligently. Yeah. If you're having trouble, seek someone out. Get a couple lessons. Learn how to use this thing, you know, so that you're using it in an appropriate way. Opera singers make tons of noise, lots, big noise uh, that carries. They're totally relaxed. I mean, the ones. And, and by the way, if you have a voice teacher that's turning purple and popping veins when they're singing, fire them and find someone else, please. Please. Yes, really good. Been there, that. done that. I have, you know, and you know, you 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 will never learn everything from one person in your life either. I've had many wonderful teachers in my life, and you cannot learn everything from one person. You learn a little bit there, a little bit there, a little bit there, a little bit. Be a smart singer, sing forever. Yeah, yeah, and live forever. Excellent advice. And actually, I'm seeing some people are cooking while watching, such as Robert Walter. I'm seeing also Tim Dundas and Kathy Collier saying hi. And I think now I, I'd be eager to find out a little bit more about your uh, voice lesson in three parts regarding posture, breath, and sound production. So shall we? Yes.
Well, why don't we give that a go? All right. You there? Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you all for joining. And those of you who are joining just late right now, we're going to do a little bit of a mini voice lesson. And uh, I thought about doing a, a song or something, but since we have some difficulties with the sound quality, I thought what I would do is do a uh, voice warm up like I would do with the choir before we would have rehearsal and maybe just talk a little bit more into detail about uh, some of the other aspects. Posture dictates the way the breath functions in the body and the way the posture and the breath are working dictates the way sound production happens. This is the, this is the holy trinity of singing. And so, you know, if there's something wrong with the way the sound's coming out, then address the way that you are breathing. If there's something that's happening not quite correctly with the breath, it's probably coming from the way that you're holding your body because the diaphragm will actually pull differently in the body depending on how we hold the body. So this is really important as a concept. And I think if I can get you thinking about this as singers, that opens up a whole new set of doors to how we produce sound. <clears throat> so the very first thing, of course, is the feet. And uh, for those of you who are yoga practitioners, you'll understand what we're doing here so imagine i'm not going to show you my foot but imagine this is your foot you have the pad under your pinky the pad under your big toe sorry i'm coordinating the camera here and you have the pad under your heel the, or the heel and you want to be standing like a t-rex you need to be standing imagine you know how chickens walk like this you know you have to imagine that you're like that with the arches lifted underneath your feet and i want you to try that let's all stand up Stop, stop chopping that onion, you know, turn off the oil, don't burn the house down. And let's, let's just try that. Become aware of how you're standing. <clears throat> and the next most important thing is to become aware of your knees. I want you to unlock your knees. And this is very important, unlock your knees. Now let's do the wrong thing, let's lock our knees. I want you to lock your knees. Okay, now when you lock your, I want you to bring your awareness to the um, to the small of your back here. And I want you to be aware of what happens back here when you lock your knees. It's very important. Unlock your knees. Lock your knees. Feel that? When you lock your knees, this entire area becomes locked. You can't move. But if you unlock your knees, the pelvis can move. You know, it can tilt back and forth. And you can actually become mobile and that's absolutely super important so let's talk about breath a little bit when we breathe the diaphragm comes down and out slightly forward slightly back uh, one of the things that i hear a lot from singers and i'd like to discuss this people say put your hand here and now we can feel our diaphragm in, right and everybody's breathing and pulling here <laughs> I want you to consciously, I want you to unlock your knees and I want you to observe what happens when you pull, when you breathe intentionally here. And I want you to observe what happens in the neck muscles. Here, go, through mouth and nose. Who felt tension right in here? Tension right there. Yeah. We use that methodology sometimes because the ribs open up there and we can actually feel the diaphragm. What I'd like to bring into your realm of consciousness here is that when we breathe, we actually expand the ribs, the intercostal muscles. The muscles between the ribs have to open up, open up, and allow that entire area to open. I want you to also imagine that you have angel's wings on your back. All right? I want you to imagine that you have wings opening up across your back, so the ribs along your back are opening as well. So let's let's plant our feet. Another thing I forgot, if you take one step forward with your right foot, then you're not only balanced this way, but you're also balanced forwards and backwards, all right? Just find that space. Unlock your knees, there you go. Now I want you to release the lower back, let this become soft. Let's open up our arms. Let's let our shoulders rest where they land. And you're going to breathe into your mouth and nose like a yawn. And you're going to open up 
all of the ribs all around. Here, good breath. Oh, now who felt the back of their throat open? Yeah. I want you to bring your awareness to the root of the tongue and the back of the throat and let those ribs open. Uh, let's use our hands as a guide. As we open the ribs, we're going to open up our uh, fingers. Here we go. Exhale. Let's inhale again. Breathe in. And exhale. There we go. Now, the inhalation for singing is one of the most natural things. What's a little bit different about singing is that we sing on the position of the inhalation. That's a little bit of a different concept. And this is how I like to explain support. Because you get people pushing and prodding and doing all sorts of things, creating tension. And what is support? Support is resisting the collapse of that breathing mechanism. So many things open up. I'm just going to tilt you a little bit more so you can see, see me a little bit more. So the ribs open up. The root of the tongue releases. The soft palate opens. And then we have these little guys here. What's in here? We have our sinuses. We have all our lovely, lovely, lovely resonators, right? And we want to open up the instrument with that inhalation. We open up the intercostal muscles, and then we learn to strengthen those intercostal muscles to keep it open as we sing, resisting that collapse. Not tight. If this is like concrete, this will be like concrete. This has to be like elastic bands. Everything in singing comes from a place of elasticity. Now we're sick and tired of me talking. So why don't we do a little bit of singing? So we're going to practice. We're going to open up our ribs. We're going to open up our throats. We're going to let the root of the tongue release and become broad across the back of the throat. Opening up the palate. And we're going to release. We're going to resist all of that collapsing. Why don't we try it? Uh, what do we try? Everybody had breath. Smile at me. Inside. Okay, you know, this, this is another thing I want to talk about. None of this when you're singing. Everybody smile real hard. You see how tight that is. No, no, no. The smile is internal. Corners of the mouth are relaxed. Everything on here is relaxed. Open those ribs. Posture. We've talked a little bit about breath. We've talked about singing on the position of the inhalation, keeping the instrument open as we sing. And what is all of singing and bel canto based on, including staccato? It's legato. All of singing is based on a line. Singing on a line. That is absolutely critical. Making long, fluid vibrations. The voice love is like balm for the voice. So, we have to sing between the words. Okay, let's see if I said. I love to sing all day long. If I went, I love singing all day long. I have to reinitiate vibration every single time. It's a lot of hard work. So if you can remember as a singer to always be aware of the alignment, knees unlocked, always be in a fluid place where you're grounded, be opening up the entire body, not just breathing here, this creates tension, and it does not support the voice correctly. You need to breathe in through the entire rib cage, and it opens it up, and then by keeping this open, keeping the mechanism open, that support, support is resisting the collapse of the breathing mechanism, not pushing and prodding, and then Letting the sound come out through that open space. We say the word and we say it and connect it on a line and you have your interpretation. And as Mark Pinzo, head uh, coach of the uh, Prague um, National Theater told me, everybody will read the phone book differently. So there is your interpretation. Anyways, 
that was a nice little uh, mini voice lesson. And uh, Dina, I think we're going to find you again. Yes. Meow, 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 meow. Yes, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> did you sing along? Yes, of course. And I did the posture. Brilliant. Everything. Yes, yes, yes. So that was super interesting. Always uh, great to hear about vocal technique. It's always useful. That makes me think about, you know, before getting to the position of uh, Queso Chorus Master, you already had an history uh, with the Queso because you've yeah. been also soloist, uh, tenor, so tenor solo for Beethoven 9. Uh, a few years ago, let's say like it. Um, do you recall right. the time how you felt about the choir behind you and uh, what could be the possibility? Right. Okay. So this was this was a few years ago, and uh, when we did the Beethoven's Night, and Bruce Bruce, who was conducting at the time, picked up the phone and called me and said, "Hey, do you think do you think your voice is big enough to sing this?" And I said, "I don't know, but I could learn it." <laughs> so I so we we I remember coming to rehearsals in the in the same place where we were where we were rehearsing just now. And uh, we were the soloists were coming and singing along. And I remember listening to the chorus, and it was interesting. I love choirs. I, I've always enjoyed working with choirs. And I just had this little little tug in my heart, thinking, oh, it would be so nice to work with this choir and see what we could do with them, you know? Because I heard all this wonderful singing behind me, and I was, I was just dying to work technically a little bit and figure out what can we sound like, you know? So it was a, a little interesting that, that that happened, you know, and then uh, quite a few years later, you know, here we are. So it was, it was kind of interesting how that yeah, worked out. I, so I strongly believe sometimes that there's this, these magic wishes that we are not even aware that we're sending to you, the, the universe and yes we make it absolutely now, you know actually wondering how we did we uh, did we get there but before uh getting to the bigger i mean to the stage of different opera houses and such i would like to know i mean i would like our audience to know a little bit more about your really interesting um parcours musical from czech republic uh, czech republic to Kamloops to Kamloops to czech republic and then get back getting back to Kamloops. so how right. did you start music and did you really start it with voice or with something else well, so I guess I am a bit of a continent hopper, and my family as well. Uh, we immigrated to Canada in 1985. I was three by the time we got here. Uh, it was still from, we kind of ran away from under the Iron Curtain. And uh, we actually spent uh, six months in the middle of winter in a refugee camp in uh, in Beograd, in, in Serbia, uh, former Yugoslavia. And... Uh, and then we came to Canada, you know, and I was small and I don't think I spoke any English until I was about five or six years old, you know, you know, it's kind of thrown into school. I think I sign language with my friends. We were living in this uh, apartment in Guildford, Surrey, full of all sorts of other immigrant children. And we used to run wild. We used to pack endangeringly, you know, kids, you know, kids used to run wild once upon a time. Anyways, uh, and uh, my, my father's side of the family, is they're all musicians, even back home. My grandfather was conducting the choir, big giant choirs at church. And I remember being a one-year-old little kid. You know, kids can crawl up. Apparently, I would crawl up behind him. And I was pretending to conduct <laughs> behind him while he was working with the choir. So choirs have always been a really essential part of kind of my upbringing. And then, you know, growing up through church and the different places, singing at school. You know, I was always surrounded by singing. And and Czechs sing everywhere. I, I, we're, we're Czech originally. Czechs sing in the pub. Czechs sing at home. Czechs sing on the street. They sing everywhere. Kids are singing all the time, and and I uh, didn't really understand that until I went back. You know, I went back and studied. I started my uh, studies here at uh, Canadian, Univ Canadian University College under Dr. Wendell and Pajitka Munro, and then I came back here, and um, you know. And, and I spent some time conducting here. I was conducting the Academy Strings and also the Camus Intermediate Orchestra at the time, which then uh, after I left kind of evolved into the Brandenburg after a few transmutations. And uh, so that was always a big part of my life. And then I went back to the Czech Republic and coming back to this, people sing. Uh, what I was amazed, we, we'd go out to, you know, a ski trip with, with the school. People bring out the guitars and they're singing, but they're singing the old folk tunes, everybody's drinking beer in Salivovice and eating speck, you know, all night long, and they're singing the old songs. So this is a big part of my culture and my heritage. 
and uh, growing up, I learned piano, you know, uh, at the age of six, because my father played piano. So actually, dad was a piano technician. He used to build pianos for, for Petrov back in the old country, and he was a piano technician also here, but then went into construction because it was, you know, it's very difficult to feed your family in this country as a musician, you know, and the people who do it are far and few in between. I think to be able to work as musicians, we're incredibly fortunate. But that was part of my family heritage, too. At the age of six, I went to piano lessons, and I hated it, absolutely hated hated piano lessons wow. <laughs> so I quit you know I quit but then it was interesting I was eight years old and I realized I had this epiphany moment I, while I was watching dad play at the piano and I realized if I don't go back into piano lessons I'll never learn to play like that so I went up to mom and I said can I please have piano lessons again and I had a wonderful teacher Gloria down in uh, Moody Music Gloria, Moody Music down in Surrey, I remember. And I just reconnected with her recently. It was it was magic. And I started studying piano. At the age of 11, I wanted to play cello. I really wanted to play cello. But uh, I guess we were a little bit low on the cash, so I got a violin for my birthday instead. <laughs> You know, so I started playing violin at the age of 11, and I've been playing ever since, too. And, you know, wind instruments. I played clarinet in high school. Like, you play, you're a clarinet player. Yeah. yeah, I played clarinet for a little while, and then I switched to flute. Flute is my love with wind instruments. So those were my three instruments. It was, it was piano, violin, and flute. And then I did go into singing eventually. I, I mean, singing was always there. I, I I remember, and then it was like singing was always there. And then I remember I didn't want to go study piano or violin at university. I, I, I was horrified of spending hours and hours in a practice room somewhere, in a dark practice room practicing, but I'd love to sing. And I said, because I always love theater. I love dressing up, you know. And so I said, but if I sing, I can be in the theater. I can sing opera. So it was funny. I took two lessons with Mary Jackson here in town, and then I went and I auditioned for my first university with Papa Gato's Aria, and then I got an email saying, yeah, you're in. Okay, good, fine. Okay. <laughs> so then I came back to Kamloops, and I, I conducted for, for a little while, but then I actually found out that I wanted more education. I wanted to get better at my craft, and I auditioned for UBC School of Opera. I also auditioned for UVic. UVic told me they didn't want me, but uh, UBC gave me money so, to, to come, so I went to UBC. And uh, that was a wonderful experience. I got to know Nancy, Nancy Hedemiston, who is still the uh, head of voice and opera division at UBC School of Music and who does wonderful work. And uh, uh, we were singing an opera in the Czech Republic one year, and Nancy couldn't go. She had some uh, extenuating circumstances. So she came to me and said, well, would you go and translate for the director? Because nobody speaks, he speaks Czech and German, and our kids speak English. So I went and I uh, translated uh, and spent a whole summer in Usti Nadlam. I'm in the Northern Bohemian Opera and Ballet uh, Theater. And uh, so I was translating for the director all day long and singing at night. You can imagine what I felt like after, you know, <laughs> including our Czech pubs, of course, you know. And oh, uh, <laughs> of course, I mean, you need the whole experience, right? Exactly. I mean, we're a pub culture. We are definitely a pub culture. I'll say that. But I was there, and, you know, while I was there, I was noticing that there is a huge culture, huge culture, and the students there are getting paid to sing, you know? So I said, I, I kind of want to be able to build my resume while I'm, while I'm studying. So, that, you know, I wrote an email to the, to, the, uh, um, to the academy, which is the University of Performing Arts, Hamu, which I, in Hamu was the Hudebni Akademi Hudebni, which is the, um, the uh, musical faculty. And I sent a little email saying, you know what, I happen to be here. It would be an absolute privilege and honor to be able to study in the country of my birth, you know, this art form. And uh, a day later, I got an email saying, well, we're auditioning the master's students. Why don't you come and sing for us? And we'll tell you, you know. So I was like, oh, so I caught the train to Prague from Wuski. And I, I went and I sang for them. And I sang the Hospodinia Mus Pastir, which is a very famous The Lord is My Shepherd from the Dvořák's biblical songs. I remember I sang Amarili for them from Kachini. And I, and I don't know, that's all they wanted to hear. And then they started talking to me and I started opening my mouth with my Moravian dialect that nobody could understand me there. So uh, it was interesting because Pani Profesorka Hayos Shiova, 
who was kind of translating my Moravian dialect, and she was Slovak, and uh, wonderful lady. And I studied with, you know, and I got accepted. I got a letter two days later saying, you're accepted for the fall. And then came this onslaught of paperwork of study visas and everything for six years. It was crazy. Standing at the foreign police, you know, two times a year <laughs> for six years. For, wow. you know, But I studied with Ivan Kusnyan for six years. Wonderful uh, instructor. Uh, wow. National uh, treasure of, you know, the National Theater there. And I would, went to the National Theater three, four times a week to study. And with and I studied with Magdalena Hayosciova as well while, she, while I was there. And she was golden as well as far as technique and working with Mr. Chumpelik, who was the uh, physiotherapist of the National Theater, who was a yogi and who did his PhD in the function of the diaphragm in the body and how it pulls and the physicality and the posture and how it all ties in to how the sound is produced. So it was a gift. It was a real gift to be able to work with these people and to take that. And then I made a decision. I said, you know what? I do not want to make my bread and butter singing on a stage. I love it, but the life is a, it's a hard life and it's a very different life from what I, what I am capable of doing, what I want to do. And I missed, I missed, I missed Canada and I missed teaching and I missed conducting. And I said, and it was interesting because initially my, my vision before I went to study I says, I want to do this. Well, I play piano, I play violin. I know I knew something about the winds. I know that kind of thing. I said, I want to learn the singing side because I want to conduct operas one day. Mm -hmm. You know, that was actually in the back of my mind. So I said, okay, I've sung, I've traveled all over the world. I've done this. Now it's time to go back and do that side of things. And it's, and it's a privilege to be able to do that with the KSO Chorus and the community ensembles that I conduct and also the Pride Choir that I've been working with. Uh, you know, the uh, Happy Choristers, our senior citizens choir in town, they're just amazing. And the TRU Chamber Chorus, who won third in the province at festival three years ago, by the way, I have to plug them. But, you know, it's been a gift. And it's been a blessing to be able to study, to bring that knowledge, bring it back home, yeah. and to work with people yeah. I, I love that you know and then to see that we can change lives through music and i'm not saying that as some euphemism or something we have changed people's lives through music and if there's a government person somewhere listening put more money into music because even germany had a battle plan during this covid to have their cultural people survive and here we're starving going to the food bank anyways that's enough Piano, piano. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's yeah. true. Yeah. True. We need to get some priorities straightened out because our crafts and what we do changes lives and provides a venue for the expression of the human spirit. Yes, totally. And I think it's so important. It is. It is super important. Uh, I mean, now we're almost at the end of uh, our discussion, Tomas, but... Uh, I wanted people to know actually that each time I'm discussing with you, I find out about one other crazy hobbies of uh -oh. you. <laughs> when it's not that like I'm having a Zoom meeting with you and I'm seeing that you have a snake around your ne neck or that you are you care. Well, that's Reggie. The snake is Reggie. Uh, Reggie. So I met Reggie. I met uh, your cat as well and such. But you're having also different kind of hobbies. And before jumping into this, uh, I would like to invite people, if you have any questions for Thomas, please write it right now. To what I understood right now, uh, Thomas, just so you understand, it looks like people who are watching live on Facebook, there's quite a delay of like 10 minutes. This is why I need to ask right now so I can get questions maybe in time. Oh, okay. They're uh, censoring us. <laughs> uh, maybe. Maybe it's, yeah. It's, it's funny though, Thomas, because when I did it alone, it was not doing so. <laughs> oh, it's me. They're censoring me. That's right. My I'm little great. plug about sponsor art. <laughs> I'm joking. I'll I'm never joking. shut up. I'll keep saying it. And <laughs> one of your first uh, hobbies that I was really intrigued is that actually, outside of also playing a violin and singing and such, yeah. you're also building violin yourself. Yeah, yeah. I started doing this a few years ago. I don't know if I have one down here. I didn't even break, I forgot my violin upstairs. Yeah, but I'm building instruments. I started doing that a few years ago and it's been a great love of mine. I've always enjoyed working with wood. And my grandfather was a, a master wood uh, craftsman, still making veneers with scrapers, you know. And and I've ever since I was a kid, I was nine years old, I ended up uh, 
I would I went down into the garage and secretly dismantled my father's wine rack and built marionette puppets out of it. <laughs> Three days later, I emerged out of the garage and showed this puppet and said, "Hey, mom, can you build clothes for it? I'll show you." You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I still keep I still keep them around, you know, my yeah. little puppets. <laughs> the lutins de Noël, those are the free, the, the lutins de Noël, right? That are making like tricks and when you're sleeping at night and such that kind of thing. <laughs> Uh, I, th I think we have pictures to show people about um, your, you actually how you build uh, violin and such, isn't it? So I'm wondering oh. if it happens. Oh, yeah. my messy shot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's my messy shop. And yeah, you know, everything's done by hand tools, really. And you know what? I had I have a little apprentice that helps me out, Jen McMillan. He's wonderful and very talented young guy, also studying voice with me. And um, he comes and helps me build instruments. And he tried cleaning my studio once and I couldn't find anything. So we keep it messy. Uh, no, and there's another photo of the wood pile, actually, I think, Ryan, if you have it. Something that's very interesting is that all the violins I make, the body and the main in this part of the instrument is all made out of BC wood. Okay. I mean, it was very clear that when I started building, I wanted to use only local materials for that. And we have some really quite beautiful sounds. Um, we were going to play something for you folks today, but unfortunately, the sound quality was so incredibly bad that uh, over this uh, system that we decided not to. But uh, maybe I'll record some Bach and post it on YouTube for you guys at some point and send a link. Yeah, that'd be great for sure. You're also having a meditation center in which you're... Oh, God, yeah. Well, it's well, interesting because, yeah, meditation is a part of my personal practice. But yeah. last summer, we had kind of a little experiment where we were doing sound meditations and incorporating different uh, sonic vibrational instruments and stuff. You can, I think you can see there's my big giant singing bowl there, my Tibetan yeah. bowl, you know. And I think, you know, as musicians or as anybody for having some sort of a practice, you know, in our lives that kind of allows us to center and uh, come into control of our mind. So it's not like this wild monkey jumping around. I think it's really important. At least it helps me a lot. I, it's like a touchstone, you know. Uh, I mean, as a musician, you end up working five, seven jobs sometimes, you know. So that's a, that's a cornerstone of my life, I think, you know. And I think you Sometimes you remember more, sometimes you remember less, but sometimes I remember in the middle of the day, like you just so incredibly, uh, you know, you can get wound up. You just sit down and you remember to breathe. You work with the breath and uh, one can center oneself. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I actually also have uh, meditation into my my, uh, my own practice just to pause a bit and being able again to center myself. And I feel that uh, taking those small pauses every day are actually more beneficial than just working like crazy, not even noticing that we're always busy, you know, and then taking a one full day of vacation. So I understood yeah. that just recently, actually, just a few months ago, that this kind of practice was to be way more um, beneficial, maybe the same way as Absolutely. the voice that efficiency, efficiency and just doing it properly uh, a yep. short amount of time is more actually better than just trying too much to, when when trying too hard actually in a bad way then it doesn't give any, any good results anyway yeah. when you're super busy and I'll tell you this from experience when you're super busy if you take three 10 minute breaks in the day to use breath to quiet the mind mm -hmm. you will get hours more of work done oh I totally agree yeah it, and it's and you're better and you can enjoy your work. I, you know, I, wasn't it the Dalai Lama that said, if every eight year old in the world mandatorily had to learn meditation, we'd have world peace, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's true, but I think just, just as a note, I, a better quality of life, I encourage my students, whether it's a, a physical meditation, like a yoga or Pilates or something, where you come back connecting breath with a physical movement it's really good and for singers especially and coming back to this longevity of singing that we talked about earlier if you have a practice where you're practicing the breath it's more important to practice the breath and visualize the singing than to spend hours singing you have to visualize the singing and practice the breath the breath you can breathe all day long and you'll make you a better singer so these practices go hand in hand you know
But my favorite meditation is sitting outside in my backyard and I could stare at these little tiny creatures for hours. Do you know what they are? No, I'm wondering now what, what new My I'm bees. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I've gone bee crazy, you know. I started keeping bees. There's their house. Wow. There's their and big house. Is it you that we have a close-up of them flying in and out. They fly in and out. Of the there they are. Okay. They're cute. They're wonderful. My ladies are wonderful. And did They're doing you so build? well this year. Did you and I'm crazy. I went and I put a beehive on my mom's patio. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm making everybody keep bees that I know because, you know, let me tell you something. When the bees go, we go. They're responsible for like 40 to 60 percent of all of our food production. I don't think people understand this. Yeah. And in Kamloops, you're allowed to keep bees. So please look into it, people. You know, these are super special part of my life these days. Yeah. It's lots of fun. So you cut out there for just a little second. I'm just going to. Totally can't hear you, Dina. Ryan, help. Hello. Oh, now I can hear you. Yay. Wow. Oh, now okay. I'm back in too. So <laughs> just in time. Hi. Okay. Oh, I think we may have fro Dina, frozen Dina again. <laughs> oh, it's all you, Daniel. It's all your fault. I guess, well, I think it's probably time. <laughs> Now to segue into a question answer period anyway. So I think I'll 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 take it take it from here. So I, I have one question. Unfortunately Dina won't be able to answer this or if she can hear me, uh feel free to I can hear you. <laughs> so jump in there. And again, anyone who's watching this live again on YouTube, we are having um we can get comments a lot quicker than on Facebook if you are on Facebook. So um but uh uh one question that I had for both of you is what are what's one or two of the great choral and orchestral works that you've always dreamed about either performing in or having as part um, of a dream season. No, not necessarily the Kamloops Symphony, but one that you've all, you know, one of your highlight choral work with orchestra. Hmm. hmm. Samat, would you like to go first? I don't have one. I have a lot of ideas. I wanted, to... you know what's interesting as far I love old music. I love old music. I, you know what? I want to do Dido and Aeneas as a whole opera. Okay. And I want to design the costumes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, for me, I would say there be tons of works for sure. Um, but maybe now in short terms, I would love to do Mozart Requiem that I didn't have the chance to do yet. And also uh, Requiem. Uh, Carmina, yes. reason that I don't know why the planets has been aligned that has been doing uh, three, four, three times with different orchestras in the past year, <laughs> uh, over one year, a kind of stretch. So that was really special. Um, so I, I can have a few years without it. I'd be fine. Uh, but uh, yeah, I guess uh, Mozart Requiem would be one of my wish and Beethoven Nine for sure. I always enjoy, even though the part of the choir is, is so small or the modern symphony involving choir for sure would be a pick. So yep. we'll, we'll see. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, I do have a question submitted uh, before uh, for, well, I guess both of you if you want, but um, how do you handle a uh, text that isn't in English or a language that people generally respond to? So for example, check if you had to coach a choir singing a check piece, how I mean, you handle I mean that? And speaking of music, music director, I mean, why did I did I have like a wonderful case of chorus master check? Then I could say, oh, then I have the opportunity of actually working on such Dvorak uh, uh, piece. Uh, yeah, exactly. So uh, for sure, having someone who's uh, who's really comfortable in that language is, is super important. Uh, so far, I've been doing mostly uh, Latin uh, and uh, Latin and English French, but it's always great when and Italian. But having someone who would be in those complex uh, languages such as uh, Russian, I've never done yet, uh, Czech as well. Of course, you need to, to, to get a lot of practice and coaching. And of course, having someone who will be able to even more materialize the, the language because in between what we can hear and what we can understand 
it takes so many levels uh, and layers. So it's a lot of study and knowing the inflection of the words of and the different particularity and characteristics of every language. And actually, usually the language is so strictly linked to also the whole culture um, of a composer of a, or a country and such that we need. Uh, I would. I would, need, I would need also to travel and to get the spirit of uh, the language and the personality of the people as well. So there's, it's a, a long, a lot, a lot of work actually to uh, to do these uh, kind of works. It is a lot of work, isn't it? it? And as singers, we're always negotiating languages. My number one advice would be if you have to sing in a language that you're not familiar with, grab a grab a native speaker and sit down with them and learn it. You know, I'm really not much from, you know, learning from recordings when it comes to language. I mean, I do record the different language, the text for my students, but you know what, when you're working with somebody and it's a skill to learn to on the spot, take notes and actually learn these things in real time because you're getting corrected in real time. The worst thing is you go with the recording, you think you're saying something right and you come back one week later, perfectly learned wrong, you know? So actually talking and what Dina said about having the context, cultural context as well, when you're talking with a native speaker, you're going to get all sorts of insights about what's going on that you wouldn't otherwise. And it really shines a light on, on the repertoire you're working on. Yes. Excellent. Is it, do you have an example of a piece that's been very difficult for you to learn? Just wondering from your past experience, either of you? I, I really struggled with German when I started singing. And of course, uh, I... I, I struggled with German. It wasn't a native tongue of mine. And um, so, of course, in my, for my bachelor recital in Prague, I decided to do an entire Liederkreis from, uh, from Schumann, Opus 30, the Eichendorf. Uh, and um, I said, okay, I'm just going to do it. And it was interesting because I had the time and space and everybody around me from the opera world spoke German. Magdalena Hayashiva spoke ger the Viennese German. <laughs> it was amazing. So... It was interesting by working on this thing uh, th for a year. After a year, if I had three beers in the pub, I started speaking German. Wow. You know, so so you know it, that was that was difficult for me, but it was also an example of like how I could learn. You know, and and during the summers when I come back home, I found German speaking people that could really, really uh, help me. Brigitta Oregan, who was a wonderful uh, lady in town, who was actually a professor at the TRU as well, uh, helped me one summer and we worked through it, worked through it. And, and you know, of course you have to learn the Hochdeutsch or the, the official kind of the theater language of that mm -hmm. language because it's not the common vernacular. It's not the the uh, it's not the language of, that the people would speak on the streets. Even Czech, nobody really speaks Czech. They all speak some dialect of Czech, right? So it's very important when you're learning how to pronounce and, things. And actually, it regarding not, this, we also need at one point to take a decision because, again, like you're mentioning, just by French, for example, le, le français québécois versus le français de différentes régions en France will be different ouais. anyway from the region you are. And then who's right and who's wrong? I mean, we, are, we could ouais. like... Oui, mais ouais, fais attention parce que quand ils montrent les films québécois en France, ils mettent les subtitres. On, et on s'entend pas sur un foulard ou une chape. <laughs> donc, uh, donc just, just for pronunciation, it's going to be the same then for German, Italian. And yeah, stuff. absolutely. And also for Camilla Burana, then there's a mix of Latin, but then a mix of also old German. And then what are you, so you try to actually understand what was actually at that time. And should we take like the German Latin pronunciation or the Ecclesiastes? Yeah. So there's all these well, absolutely. You can was, all time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, and there with the Camilla Burana, it came out of the context of what we were doing because we're not really going to use Ecclesiastic Latin when we're talking about debauchery during the Middle Ages. So you know, okay. so I mean, so there is the context, really important, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so changing. Uh, oh, well, it's being prompted for me, so I don't have to read it out. But here's a question from Karen McClellan. You can see on the screen there. Uh, how can you achieve the vocal quality you're talking about if you have to sit and sing? And I assume it in tangentially, oh. if you have to do actions while you're singing, so in an opera, or staging, and that kind of 
I mean, recently regarding sitting, uh, there's been a prep performance a year ago, and I've been discussing uh, that with several singers in Montreal because I was impressed that the conductor had decided everybody was to be sitting down, and we had a discussion further down, uh, further um, after that about oh, are we going to do this with the Grand Ballet Canadien and the choir being sitting down? And actually, the, if you're professional and you know exactly how to to place your air and everything, it's actually not a big challenge to what understood. So I guess uh, it's all about um, good um, experience uh, in different uh, posture. But then when you're opera singer on stage, I mean, it's not only sitting. Sometimes you're dying on stage. Sometimes you're you need to do acrobatics and still sing. I've been, I saw Barbara Hannigan doing Lulu uh, in Hamburg and she was just like the most incredible soloist jumping in the air and still singing perfectly in pitch and, you know, having the perfect uh, breath support. So I guess uh, you just need to be as crazy to be sportive, athletic and knowing really well your body to make it work, I guess. I will never accept orchestral musicians complaining about sitting and playing. I was singing, uh, we were doing Il Tritico, Il Tabarro from Puccini down in San Francisco uh, a few summers ago at the Basotti Institute. And I sang the tenor. I was dying on stage being murdered while simultaneously repeating high B flaps for eight bars. So, <laughs> so you learn how to use your technique. So don't become a tenor. You always die a brutal death on stage while singing high B class repeatedly over about eight bars and your ribs are doing this, you know? So anyways, yeah, just a wow. little pearl of insight. Wonderful. <laughs> I think uh, we're getting to the end, huh? right, Daniel? We're yes, yeah. We should probably wrap it up here for today and let people get on with their dinner or wherever they may be. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And sorry about the technical difficulties. But um, uh, for those of you, uh, we should have a, a full recorded version up uh, shortly uh, for this whole presentation if you want to rewatch it for those who did experience those difficulties. Sorry again. So uh, before we formally wrap up, I do want to do our official thank you again. Thank you to our public funders, and we are calling all all of you if you are listening to help support the arts, as Tomas greatly mentioned. It's definitely important uh, government support of the arts, but we are thankful for everything we have been provided so far. Uh, of course, I want to thank all our donors, our sponsors for their continued support, as I did at the beginning. Uh, in helping us ensure that the Camus Symphony remains active in, in our community. Thanks, of course, to both our panelists today. So Dina and Tomas, thank you so much for joining us uh, and sharing your your thoughts. Thank you for Ryan for editing this session behind the scenes and getting this all together. And thank you, of course, to all of you, uh, those watching from our, your homes and taking the time to tune in and for engaging with us in this virtual event. Of course, we welcome feedback and ideas for future, future sessions. If there's someone in the symphony that you want to hear from or something you want to learn about, please let us know either in the comments or sending your ideas to info at camloopsymphony.com. So thank you so much, uh, everyone. Stay safe and healthy. And uh, we look forward to connecting again with you very soon. All the best. <laughs>